There it comes. Ooh! My name is Joseph Carter, and I am the Mink Man. When I was a senior in high school, I started learning about the American mink. I was told that mink were horrible, vicious little animals who were impossible to tame. Challenge accepted. I've been in love with mink ever since. I get mink from fur farms and give them a new life. In this new life, my mink live as naturally as possible, even hunting for their dinner the way a wild mink would. So come join me on my adventures as we learn more about this intense little predator, the amazing American mink. Now if you're really wanting to dive into mink and learn the nitty gritty details, I would strongly recommend you read my book, The New Sport of Minkinry. If you would like to support us, you can buy a shirt or hat, or consider becoming one of my faithful patrons. Just go to the links in the description below. So today we're out doing a little muskrat hunting along the canal. And uh, we've got midnight and spot. We're going to start out with midnight. If you look down here in the canal, make sure you get out of it. You can see that I kind of mucked it up walking around, but there's a, a little spot right there where uh, it looks like a muskrat den. And then I kind of mucked it up, but we could see muskrat trails down in the water previously. So we're pretty sure something's in this area, whether it's exactly here or not, we'll have to find, we'll have to wait and see, but there should be something in the general area based off of the sign we're seeing. Good old midnight, he found where they really were. I saw some sign back there, but it was really just sign from these feet, these muskrats traveling down there to feed. They're not denning down there at all. Those are just feeding holes and a feeding location from this colony. I don't know if he just happened to go the right way or if he smelled them, but good job, Mr. Midnight. We tried to catch a muskrat at this location for a good half an hour to an hour, but the conditions were just too difficult. The water was deep and murky and there were lots of different places for the muskrats to hide. So we decided to move on down the canal and try for an easier location with water that was much more shallow. He came out in the other way though. Oh! Chased it out. Grab it, grab it, grab it by the tail, babe. Look 
Okay, went down the hole again. It's back over here. It's going this way. This muskrat decided if he was going down, he was going down with his boots on. As you may have probably noticed from my other videos, muskrats can be surprisingly bold and aggressive. Sometimes these kamikaze charges at a mink will unnerve the mink and cause them to flee. Like in this video, where Abby the mink had to be rescued by my dog Elsa. Good girl, she got it. Good girl. Good job, Elsa. Out. Out. Mink muskrat interactions aren't always as, as straightforward as my videos make them appear. Mink and muskrats, um, though of course they have a predator-prey relationship, just like a lot of other predator-prey relationships, it's not just the mink pursuing the muskrat. Um, just like with lions, say, for example, if you've ever watched a documentary where lions are chasing uh, those great big uh, Cape Buffalo, sometimes the Cape Buffalo are just as actively pursuing the, the lions. And the same happens with mink, more specifically with mink who don't have the best of confidence when it comes to hunting muskrats. Muskrats will actively pursue and pressure a mink out of an area if the mink isn't confident enough to confront the muskrat directly. Unlike Abby, Spot has proven in this and many other circumstances that he has more than enough confidence to take a muskrat head on, tooth to tooth. Gonna give Midnight another try, see if he can find that second muskrat. <laughs> this then must have a strange underwater side passage that the muskrat turns down right next to the one that Midnight is using. Those ripples a moment ago were clearly from a submerged muskrat coming out briefly, then going back inside the den, completely submerged the entire time. It is clear Midnight is a little confused as to where the muskrat has gone, and he's running back and forth trying to pick up its trail. He sniffs the den entrance and realizes the muskrat has snuck back into the burrow. Midnight comes out again and quickly looks around, but not seeing the muskrat, he goes back in the hole. Wait a minute, what was that? I'll be honest, I didn't notice this muskrat peeking out until I was completely done editing the video. So unknown to all of us, while Midnight was looking up and down the canal for the escaping muskrat, the muskrat was quietly peering out of his hole watching him. As soon as Midnight disappeared down the hole, the muskrat ducked under the water and tried to sneak away unnoticed. Yeah. 
As soon as he was out of the burrow, Midnight clearly detected the muskrat's fresh trail and began to follow his nose. Like a bloodhound searching for a fugitive, Midnight follows the muskrat's trail right to its next hiding place. There it comes. Ooh! Grab that one, Joe. Right there. It's interesting watching Midnight pursue the muskrat. He clearly understands that in the water the muskrat can easily outswim him, but on land, he can run faster than the muskrat can both run and swim. So he stays on the shore while the muskrat swims back and forth. The muskrat also instinctively understands the advantage it has in the water, both for escaping the mink as well as for fighting. That's why he doesn't leave the water even when given plenty of opportunities to do so. While we were catching the second muskrat, the third one was likely waiting near the entrance of his den, ready to flee at the slightest disturbance. Muskrats instinctively know that being down in their den is the most dangerous place they can be when a mink is around. That's the big one you saw? So, this is what we've been after, muskrat. Let's take a look at these guys closer. Okay, so when you hold these guys, you want to hold them near the end of their tail. They can bend up and bite you. Even from here it's possible, it's just not as likely. So you want to hold them near the end of their tail. Unlike brown rats, they cannot, uh, whew, he got right through the glove. They can't, their tail doesn't break off. So you don't have to worry about it breaking off like smaller rodents like mice or brown rats. They're mostly an herbivore, but they do eat other plant, uh, things other than plants. Uh, mussels, crayfish, fish. But typically that is only a very small part of their diet. And when they are eating oh, very much of it, That little tooth grinding sound. That's about the only sound I've ever heard them make. If they make any other sounds, it's not very often or it's very quiet. Unlike brown rats, which are quite vocal when they're captured, muskrats are silent. And they can get through these gloves if they get you just right. Oh, it's a wild animal. Why is it nice? No, it's not nice. He's an ouchie. Oh. A rat is an ouchie. <laughs> so if you look, do a close up on their tail, on his tail. Hold on, he's making that noise again. Now if you look at their tail, it's not round like a normal brown rat. It's actually kind of flat. It's flat the opposite of a beaver. Their tail is flattened vertically. And I assume it's to help them swim. They kind of paddle their tail a little bit as they swim. And then if you look at their feet, they've got big paddle-like feet on their back. Their back feet's what does most of the propelling when they're swimming, and they paddle with those. Their front feet are used mostly for digging. Um, when I see them swim, it seems like their front feet are kind of just tucked in and they're paddling with their back feet. 
and they'll dig dens, but they'll also dig up roots to eat. Their diet is pretty much anything plant that's near the water. Uh, they love cattail roots. They'll eat Phragmite, those weeds that were back at the last place we were at. Anything that grows green along the sides of the bank, so they'll eat grass and clover and dandelions. And then down in the water, water lilies and uh, pretty much anything, <laughs> it's green. Um, if you look at their fur, they've got a real nice dense coat. And a lot of people don't realize it, but their fur has some value. People think of beavers as being made into coats or hats, but actually muskrats have more value per square inch. Of course, a beaver itself has more value, but they're more than 10 times the size of the muskrat. But if you look at the actual square inches of their pelt, the, the muskrat's worth a little bit more. For me, the value more than their fur is their meat. They're actually quite tasty to eat. And um, of course, it's great mink food. Most people don't realize it, but not so long ago, eating muskrats was quite common. They would often sell them under some fake name like marsh hare. But in those days, trappers would typically sell the muskrat meat to markets and restaurants, in addition to selling the furs to fur buyers. This greatly increased their profits from trapping efforts and made trapping muskrats that much more profitable. What I do with the pelts rather than sell them for money is I trade them for more muskrat meat. Uh, the trappers, they typically just throw away their muskrats and beavers. Sometimes they use it as bait, but usually they just throw it away. So I can trade them these furs from the muskrats that I catch for more of the for the meat of the muskrats and beavers that they catch. All of the muskrats and beavers we get from fur trappers go into making mink food. We only eat the muskrats and beavers that we catch ourselves. And since I'm basically trading them for their garbage, I get a lot better deal than if I was to sell them for cash. Alrighty little guy. I'm sure he's he's tired of being handled. He's tired the minute we caught him, right? He's like, let me go, man. So we're just gonna let this little guy go. We caught two today. Um, we're just gonna let this little guy go. We're not doing pest control here. We're just hunting for meat, fur, and the enrichment of the mink. I mean, the, the, the canal company actually very much appreciates that we're hunting it, but I'm not getting paid to do pest control, so there's no reason to kill everything we catch. So we're gonna let this little guy go. He'll live another day. Maybe we'll catch him again, maybe we won't. Ready to go back, little man? I don't typically do the whole catch and release thing, but I felt kind of bad for this little guy being all stressed out while I held him during our discussion on muskrats. So I figured I would just let this one go, and maybe one of my mink would catch him again someday, and maybe they wouldn't. If we never catch him again, that would be just fine, because that would give him the opportunity to possibly produce more muskrats for us to hunt in the future. <laughs>